hey, hi, hello, welcome back, Alexandrian Codex, playing some Islanders because, uh, man, I just, I just, I don't have the right headspace to play much of anything right now. I'm, I'm sitting here in my studio, alone, just kind of doom scrolling, and not, not doing anything productive with the energy. So, it's probably best if I play some Islanders and vent a little bit. I was thinking about writing, but I don't know. I'm just... God, I'm fucking tired. I'm... Tired of everything. I am utterly exhausted. Ah. <sighs> Today, this is this has been a, a shitty week uh, for me personally, for a lot of people in general. For me personally, because after being on unemployment for five months, the Washington State Unemployment Office decided that I was never accepted on unemployment in the first place. And that I would need to retroactively pay back everything that had been paid out for the last five months. Uh, their explanation for why was two sentences long and not clear at all. Just that I quit for a reason that they didn't consider good enough. A good reason. Uh, even though the reasons I quit do qualify as good enough, they just, for whatever reason, decided eh, not good enough. So I had to uh, appeal that, which will be resolved in a hearing, but the fact that it took five months for... <laughs> them to decline me in the first place when I thought I was accepted probably means it's going to take weeks or months to get to the point where there's a hearing. And I'm, I'm, on one hand, I feel very strongly about, like, I'm in the right here. But on the other hand, I know that being in the right in the United States does not have anything to do with winning out in court winning out in hearings, winning out in settlements, winning out in our judicial system has very little to do with right and wrong. So part of me is like, ah, you know, it'll get resolved. And the other part of me is like, eh, it won't get resolved. I'm probably going to get fucked by this. <sighs> so that, that kind of sucks, right? And that's that's been making it very hard for me to focus on anything else. I've been fixating pretty hard on that because, you know, I have I have like eight grand right now and that should be enough to get me through the end of January before I am eating through my savings. So I'm I'm alright. But uh, being being in default, more or less, with uh, this state entity is essentially the same thing as owing the IRS money. So if there were some sort of federal program, like, uh, like the $1,200 <laughs> shitty assistance package that went out in the spring, that was paid through tax returns that was paid through that system if that were to happen according to the system I owe $16,000 I don't uh, and after this is resolved I won't but I have no timeline for when it will be resolved so I'm not getting anything right now which means I'm just eating into the red which is you know manageable and 
even if there is something outside of unemployment that happens before this is resolved, I'm probably not going to be able to get it because of this stupid miscommunication. Now I'm assuming it's a miscommunication. I'm assuming it's just some pedantic thing. I'm assuming that it's not my former employer being malicious. Because, I mean... It, they could be. I work for an HOA. <laughs> um, but I'm assuming it's not that. I'm assuming it's just... Overworked people and... Vague criteria for things. Ah, <sighs> so I'm... Not in a horribly vulnerable position. I've started applying for more positions than I was. Lots of remote work. Now come come like November, December, that's probably gonna be when I get desperate enough to start applying for in-person positions. Maybe. It really depends how COVID is going. I might play it pretty close to the chest. Honestly, and I appreciate, you know, even though, um, this is very stressful, even though, uh, this is very far from ideal, I'm still remarkably fortunate to have the sort of, uh, yep, yeah, it's, it's me to just, it's stream time for Alex to, uh, talk about my life and socialism. We're, we're not to... We're not the revolutionary stuff yet, it's mostly me just trying to talk myself down from being stressed out about not having income anymore. Even, even if uh, everything goes terribly and I owe the government $16,000 that I shouldn't owe them, and by no logical reason should owe them, I, it's basically a loan. <laughs> it's basically a sixteen thousand dollar loan with like an insanely low interest rate, and I, you know, <sighs> that's not that terrible. And white collar crime happens in the United States all the time. Not that I intend to <laughs> participate in that, but yeah, there's there's bigger fish to fry right now. Marry a bougie and accidentally yeet him off the balcony. Yeah, yeah. You know, when I first moved to Seattle, my friend who I moved here with, and I'll leave them unnamed, and I, because this is not a, a flattering story to get into, we joked about that sort of thing. When we were both struggling to find work, when I was living and working at a hostel, we joked about, like, yeah, just gotta find... a rich, uh... <laughs> Rich sugar daddy slash mama slash uh, sucrose guardian to uh, take us in. That's a nice fantasy, right? Everyone wants to be taken care of. Everybody wants to know that people have their back. And, you know, I, ha I have a network that I can call upon if... I really, really need it. But I'm not there yet, and I need... I think in, like, quarters, I think in, like, years when it comes to finances. I don't think in weeks, I don't think in months. I, I'm, i like, insanely uncomfortable if I'm not fiscally resolved for a year. Because I've, I've been functionally homeless in my life. I have been unemployed for years before. I've gone years without more than, uh, you know, 500 bucks in my bank account. Uh, most of the time I had less than 100 bucks in my bank account. So, <laughs> we're all bratty subs deep inside, yeah. So it's not unfamiliar territory, it's just I really, 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 really do not ever want to go back to that. That's some traumatizing shit and, ooh lord, I would really, really prefer not to. 
But it's really hard to post about this or talk about this in light of just, you know, everything fucking else going on. You know, some of the worst political unrest in American history, some of the longest lasting political unrest in American history now becoming uh, just on par with violence. I mean, we, we have militias. We have full-blown militias in various states, in various cities, squaring off against each other. And, you know, I'm fully in favor of the Antifa militias and uh, black militias that are standing up against alt-right folks. And I say militias, and I want to make a distinction between protesters and militias. Protesters are not militias. When I say militias, I mean the John John Brown Rifle Club, right? I mean the various uh, Black Panther uh, imitation groups or descendant groups or things like that. I mean, tonight, uh, Wisconsin has multiple cities that have riots going on. And uh, deservedly so. Now, people have talked about these Black Lives Matter protests like they'll just go away, like they'll end, like. <sighs> yeah, do your part. Grab a rifle or grab a hoe. Honestly, that's that's been occupying my thought thoughts a little bit. Now, it's it's hard to be leftist right now and not feel drawn towards gun ownership. I live in, a, in an apartment, man. There's very few weapons, firearms I could have that would not be a potential danger to my neighbors. So even if I were inclined to, it would be stupid to. And also, like, gun security in an apartment is really not great. And I live in a major metropolitan area, so uh, as far as growing stuff goes, I don't really produce that much. Uh, we are a post-industrial society, one that is rapidly and rampantly divorced from the means of production and the means by which the society sustains itself. Food is largely mechanized. Production is increasingly mechanized. You know, mutual aid is uh, is a beautiful idea in theory, but mutual aid is kind of a fantasy so long it's tied to a capitalist means of production. So long as it's tied to someone somewhere along the down the line is making money and donating money from capitalism participation in or exploitation by capitalism because you're still feeding into the same system and I'm, I'm not trying to uh, you know purity police here and be like oh you can't resist capitalism while participating within it you can it's just it's fucking complicated and I'm, I'm definitely feeling very aware of how far away I am from friends and family, from people I could directly support, from farmers I know, things like that. Ah, and it, it's very hard not to just get wrapped up in big doomer energy, because like, it's really, 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 really hard to imagine how things will get better. <laughs> like, I really don't think they will. I, I really don't think they will anytime soon. Yeah, yeah, that's a nice thing about Argentina. I mean, to be fair, Washington State is a massively agricultural it has a massively based, uh, agriculturally based, there we go, economy. Uh, Eastern Washington produces a lot of food. 
but it's also the conservative part of the state. You know, I don't live in Arizona anymore. I don't live in Nevada, Utah, Texas even, that produce a lot of cattle. Not a lot of grain, not a lot of fruit. And agriculturally aren't uh, aren't self-sufficient. My God, God, can you imagine living in Alaska right now? Or living north of the Arctic Circle and a lot of the native communities up there, indigenous communities up there? Now, their, their food security is already shaky and tenuous at best. Largely dependent on imports from the south by plane. For huge swaths of the year. So yeah, I'm fortunate in a lot of ways. Like, I, I have a lot of things that are not going the way I want them to, but still I have a lot of privilege. I have a lot of, well, not a lot of capital. I have some capital in reserve because I'm smart and I save and I'm affable and I'm intellectual and I'm clever and if I really push at it I could get a job I hate within a month I could, I'm hoping I can get a job I like in like five months <laughs> but honestly I'm deeply pessimistic about the likelihood of that I, I really am deeply pessimistic now if you're listening to this and I've applied to a job at your company. One, wow, dude, way to really overdo it on the uh, research. But <laughs> if I've applied, I actually want to work there. I haven't gotten to panic applying yet. I'll get there, probably like October. But not yet, not yet. Um, yeah, fuck, I don't know. I haven't been protesting. I feel like I'm very embarrassed about that, frankly. But, like, I don't... I've been having a hard time seeing what good it's doing here in Seattle. Like, what's the fucking point is kind of where I'm at. And I know that's not productive, but I really don't believe that the protests are doing much. Um, because the, uh, the very, very, very limited cuts that the city council did sign off on, the mayor just vetoed. And it had a veto-proof majority, but they haven't gone through the process to pass it anyway. So removing the mayor from office is really... Removing Jenny Durkin from office seems to be like, oh, okay, this is the thing we have to do next. And that's, like, a six-month process to get her out. Like, the first step is already done, and now petitions have to go around to show that there's popular support, and at least 50%, a number of people equal to 50% of the people who voted or voted for her need to sign saying that they want a vote of no confidence and remove her from office. And then she'll have a chance to push back against that in court. And God knows that can drag on forever. And it just really doesn't feel like anything meaningful is going to be done anytime soon. So the Seattle protesters, and really the protesters overall, who I support the most, are those who are taking direct action, if you will. I'm not really in a place where I can participate in direct actions. I don't have a community here. I'm a transplant, and a fairly recent transplant, and uh, honestly, a fairly preclusive transplant at that. For a lot of reasons, mostly they're excuses, but we can call them reasons. Yeah, 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 you can push back a vote of no confidence through the judiciary. You can push anything through the judiciary here in the United States. You can appeal fucking anything. And get it caught up in court for years or decades if you want. That's, that's the American way of life. We love 
our needlessly complicated judicial system. Like, even here in Seattle, we had a, a tear gas ban. I think we still have a tear gas ban. The tear gas ban was temporarily suspended thanks to a judicial authority. They can just do that. They can override popular law. They can override essentially anything they want on tenuous legal grounds and then argue about if it was legal or not for months or years later. Uh, no, I'm pretty sure I want to move to a real country, but most countries have us in quarantine right now because they should, so even if I had the ability to leave the country, I can't. I have applied to jobs in other countries, looking at you, Paradox, um, and I will continue to. But, you know, who the fuck wants to hire an American in the midst of this pandemic? I mean, my, my resume is not inspiring, to be frank. <laughs> it really isn't. Like, as a candidate, I shine if you talk to me. If we actually have a conversation about whatever it is the work does, I can demonstrate that, yeah, I know what the fuck I'm talking about. But because I didn't go to school for whatever specific degree, or I didn't intern for yada yada, it's been a lot of entry-level positions for me. And that's just the way it goes. I really don't want to be me-centric. I know I am, because, uh, I'm, like, super anxious and depressed, and venting helps with that. I, I've been playing a ton of games lately, but, like, ARK particularly, I'm really not enjoying it. I'm, like, actively not enjoying it. Parts of it I'm enjoying, but, like, I don't like sitting in a Discord call and just talking about a game and pretending like everything's okay or normal, like pretending like the world's not on fire. I don't like sitting around having calls with friends and not being like, hey, so what are you doing about the protests? I, like a lot of my friends live in very small or small cities in the Midwest in the United States. So they feel like there's nothing to do that everything going on is far away and there's no popular support where they are and so all they can really do is go through the motions and keep their heads down and hope it gets better and I don't like being in that headspace I don't like being caught up in that headspace I don't like being roped in that headspace because it it's unproductive and it's sheltered and it's it's incredibly privileged and useless it's so useless and I don't know, there's not a lot I can do now, where I am. But God, I at least want to talk about it. I at least want to be mad about it. I at least want to not be the one person in the call who every day is like, Oh, did you hear about the shooting here? And everybody's like, no. And I'm like, what the fuck? You need to be more proactive in educating yourselves and following better news sources and following activists on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and Twitch, YouTube, just all kinds of different social media. Like, I don't know. I mean, I, everyone has a past to be lazy every once in a while. It's, it's important and necessary for you know, your mental well-being and emotional health. But in Indiana particularly, where I grew up, there's such an attitude of like, well, nothing I can do about it. We just live in too conservative of an area. We just had to, just gotta get used to it and accept it or just get through it. Like, things suck. And that's the way they are. Like, I'm from a part of the country that's just so resigned to things being terrible that they don't have the spirit to even try to change anything. 
They've just accepted that life sucks. And they're trying to just... Enjoy what parts of it they can. I don't know. It's... it's... just very difficult for me. And I love these friends, and I love playing games with them. But, like, part of, part of maintaining a friendship with me, a healthy friendship with me, is engaging in political <laughs> discussions and dialogue. It's engaging critically with the world that we live in. It's not just doing things for entertainment. Games are not entertainment for me. Games are art for me. Games are political for me. <laughs> if things suck, then fight for the freedom to suck dick. Mahatma Gandhi. And eh, that's totally a Gandhi quote. I believe that was... That was in the... God, imagine an alternate universe where Gandhi was actually like... A, a cool dude. <laughs> And not like he was he was rampantly homophobic right he maybe not well why why am i remembering gandhi being problematic but not how he was problematic it was sex related can't remember how ah uh. I mean, Americans a month ago were outraged at the idea of federal officers arresting people and pulling them in unmarked vans, and that, that's still happening. It's happening in Wisconsin right now, and people have just lost their outrage. And I see people, I really mean liberals. I really, really mean liberals. Uh, yeah, he was rather uh, domestic abusey. That's true. Gandhi. I'm, I'm so fucking sick of liberals. I'm so sick of the norm... like, the perpetuation of liberal identities is normal. Like, I... I... I hate mainstream American culture to the bone. No, just... just to the bone. Like, news stations covering the Republican National Convention. Why? Why are you doing that? If you, like, don't politically agree with them, why are you covering it? Because you're an independent news source? No, you're not. No news is independent. Everything you do is political. Every <laughs> minute of screen time you give is political. Who you give a microphone to, who you give voice to, who you don't. That's actively political. Like NPR right now, just going on and on and on about the fucking... Uh, conventions. And just being silent about the protests. Is because, desperately, the corporate uh, political machine in this country is trying to recontextualize everything going on as something that you can just vote through. Oh yeah, you just gotta get out and vote. You just gotta participate in the political process. That'll fix things. But you you can't. You can't. What's wrong with America is a deeply entrenched capitalist system. A deeply entrenched ruling uh, class of kleptocrats. Honestly, this might sound horrible, but unless the U.S. goes through all the shit they put countries through, liberals will literally never understand when to stand their ground. That's not terrible to say. That's true. We're sheltered. We're incredibly sheltered. We're incredibly ignorant. I mean, I'm incredibly ignorant. Our country is... My country, I should say, is sheltered, privileged, and ignorant to a teeth to an extreme. And 
what we're undergoing now is really waking a lot of people up to the reality that we are a failing nation. We are a failing experiment. We are a failing country in many, 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 many ways. And so many techniques that for decades, centuries even, centuries, honestly, we have practiced overseas at oppressing populist movements, in installing business interests over political interests, in violently taking down individuals before they can organize their communities, in arming militant groups to do their dirty work for them. All of these things are coming home to roost right now. Now, for decades, really, it, uh, a lot of this started started in, in full form in the Gilded Age, in the late 1800s. In the late 19th century is when a lot of this started for the United States, where we began to practice our craft. Smegley Butler was the first one to, one of the first ones, I should say, to really write about it and really look at it, critique it, in his short book, it's a good book, called War is a Racket, talking about he fought wars for American business interests in all these different countries, and saw time and time again how all of these wars he was fighting for freedom and democracy and liberation and protecting Americans was all about business interests, was all about making money for fruit companies, for trade companies, for whatever else. And, I mean, fuck. In Seattle, we have a private security force that's been running around with the police. That's just blatantly working with them. Not like kind of sort of working with them or wink wink nudge not nudge nudge working with them. They're just working with them. <laughs> and we're not unique in that. We're really not unique in that respect. I, when I say I have a hard time seeing how things get better, I want to be very clear about what I mean there. For me personally, yes, I'm talking about that. But more broadly, I mean this pandemic is not going to end miraculously. If, if a vaccine is discovered, if an effective vaccine is made, and again, this is an if because some diseases, like the flu, are so... Uh, mutagenic that one year's vaccine won't work the next year. COVID has proven already, COVID-19 has proven, and uh, similar years, uh, diseases, similar diseases in years past have proven that this is a highly flexible microorganism. It's very, very capable of rapid, unexpected, evolutionary leaps. <sighs> I'm, not, I'm not trying to say we're fucked, it's just we're fucked if we're continuing to do things the way that we're doing things and insisting that it, it'll work if we just keep at it. After Italy, Garibaldi went on to fight dozens of wars around the world, including early Argentine Uruguayan civil wars on the unitary side. Yeah, I kind of knew something about that. I don't know that much about Garibaldi, to be honest. Italian history is not my strong suit. I've, I've learned modern Italian history broadly like three or four times, but it's very, it's been very difficult to retain for whatever reason. And that's, that's just COVID that I'm talking about. COVID, 
there's no end in sight. There's absolutely no end in sight. Thousands of people are dying every day, and that's not declining. And given the economic conditions that we're putting people in, how could it possibly decline? Because people are being pushed into working when they shouldn't be working, at jobs they shouldn't be working, that aren't safe, and they're being forced to participate in communities that aren't safe. How could it be going any other way, right? Okay, so lots of businesses are closing, and have closed, and are staying closed probably forever, because of COVID. So those are lots of people who are never going to be employed by those same employers. And we, we can really look at the 2008 financial crisis for what's going to happen next. What's going to continue to happen is businesses and oligarchs will consolidate wealth. They will buy up failing companies. They'll buy up abandoned property just to get more capital, get more wealth, get more assets. And it will continue consolidating ownership in fewer and fewer hands. Leaving more and more people actively dispossessed. And I don't mean like, oh, they're lower class. Oh, you know, they're working minimum wage. No, I mean homeless. We've had tent cities in the United States for over a decade now. I mean, we've had tent cities for a long time. But we've had tent cities in most major cities in the west coast for over a decade and they've just gotten bigger over time there have been lots of initiatives about tiny homes about getting people in houses and you know helping out homelessness people affected by homelessness and you know uh to some degree there have been some successes but homelessness still exists and with the looming crisis here in a few months, well, here in a month or two, really depending on what the federal government does and what state governments do, with unemployment drying up for so many people, or never manifesting, with no federal aid program happening at all, with the moratorium on evictions going away in so many places, our homeless crisis of the last 10 years is about to look like a joke. It's it's about to look like a pale imitation. Now, people talk about, Americans talk about, well, this isn't a real depression. If it were, where are the tent cities? There have been tent cities for a long time, and they're about to get a lot bigger. Just because you don't see something on the corporate media platforms that you engage with doesn't mean that they don't exist. It just means it's in somebody's interest not to show it to you. I, yeah, my, my parents are blisteringly optimistic, or they're trying to be. They're trying to be optimistic. They're trying to be encouraging. They're trying to be like, ah, oh, Alex, you know, you're great. You're gonna land on your feet. You know, you're you're gonna get a job, and you know, you're gonna be fine. I'm like, I'm not really worried about me right now when I'm posting that everything's just gonna keep getting worse. That's not what I've been posting about for the last God, six months at this point. Five, six months is. No, dude, I'm terrified of a civil war. I'm terrified that if these social and fiscal inequities continue to go unaddressed and unanswered, if thousands of people continue to die every day, if police violence continues to be as rampant as it is, if militias continue to be emboldened and enabled by state and federal authorities, we will have a civil war. I posted earlier this week that what we are seeing right now is in my mind very reminiscent of the burning Kansas period of American history. The burning Kansas period, if you're not familiar with you know, mid-1800s American history, and I mean 
of course you're familiar. Who isn't, right? Uh, Burning Kansas was when the statehood of Kansas and other Midwestern states, Nebraska, I think, uh, were trying to be decided. Those states had to decide whether to enter the Union as slave states or free states. And those decisions were made by popular vote of landowners, whatever the landowners decided. So people from free states would move to states like Kansas and people from slave states would move to states like Kansas in order to fix the vote, in order to try to change the vote. They would move there entirely for that reason. And knowing that other people were doing the same thing, you know, those damn lib Yankees moving into my Kansas trying to get rid of our right to choose if we want to have slaves or not, the pro-union, or pro-abolitionist, uh, and the pro-slavery factions started killing each other. With militias, with gangs, with individual small bouts of violence, in all, I think Burning Kansas only killed like, what, like a hundred people? Let's Google this. Burning Kansas. Burning Kansas, or Bloody Kansas, or Border War, it lasted between 1854 and 1861. Uh, Anti-slavery settlers, approximately a hundred died. Pro-slavery settlers, approximately 80 died. roughly. I mean, these are very, very rough numbers. And that was over the course of, again, better part of a decade. We're starting to get there. We're really starting to get there. People think about the Civil War like it just popped out of nowhere. No, there were decades of resentment and violence and escalation leading up to that point. We're not just gonna just next month be like, okay, everybody pick a state line, let's go. No, it's these these ties that have bound us together start getting loose. And we start having more and more differences than we have similarities. And the people who are desperate, the people who are hungry, the people who are really in need get more and more desperate. And that was a civil war of states, right? A civil war that we're more likely to see in the near future is borderline revolution, or outright revolution, right? That's what a lot of people are calling for. That's what a lot of people are desperately crying out for, even. Is meaningful, substantial reform and if reform is impossible, then revolution. It's, it's amazing to me, it's actually amazing to me how deeply in denial Democrats are about this. Republicans, I feel like uh, at least some of them can see it for what it is, and they're reactionary fascists, but I think a lot of them at least see which way the wind is blowing. The Democrats are acting like, whoa, we just got to vote in sleepy Joe Biden and top cop Harris and that'll fix everything. Sure. Sure. Yeah, that, yep. You totally understand the country. You're totally not violently disconnected from reality. <sighs> so I don't know. I don't know. If I had more friends here, if I had more of a community here, I would be protesting every day. I was protesting every day for like a week. And I live alone. I don't have any friends nearby. I, I don't know if there's anyone who would notice if I just got disappeared at a protest. <laughs> Especially because... I'm not saying when and where I'm going or what I'm doing, right? It'd take a while for my absence to be noted. And that isn't a self-depreciating, mm, no one loves me thing. That's a, hey, this is a real safety concern thing. 
you need to have people who will notice you're missing. You need to have people who will check up on you and check in on you, look after you, and literally and metaphorically have your back. If you're going to be participating in peaceful protests, in uh, extra legal activities, in whatever. Especially considering that peaceful protesters can now be shot and killed by militia members and large swaths of the country will side with the militia members. Especially now that you can be run over peacefully protesting and large swaths of the country will side with the people who committed vehicular homicide or vehicular manslaughter rather than the people who were practicing their rights as supposedly guaranteed by the Constitution of the United States. It's a hard time to be making comrades, right? Because any any leftist with good sense should be, should genuinely be on high alert about infiltration, about people they don't know, about outsiders like me who come from outside their community and want to participate in uh, their communities, who want an end to their community, who want inclusion and participation. Now, fear of an outsider, xenophobia, is a fairly natural thing, fundamentally. Is it a good thing? No, bigotry is bad. But being afraid, being paranoid, especially if you are some sort of revolutionary, some sort of reformist, let's say, rather than revolutionary, if you're some sort of reformist, in the United States, there is a long, bloody, terrifying history of why you should be mistrustful, of why you should be looking over your shoulder. And going back to the Pinkerton uh, agencies, in, again, the 1800s, there are federal agencies, state agencies, and private agencies whose entire purpose of existence is to infiltrate potentially potent movements, potentially revolutionary movements, potentially powerful social movements, and destroy them, or disassemble them, or corrupt them, or, as neoliberalism and capitalism are so want to do, twist them and incorporate them. like pink hat feminism. That's a great example. Like pride merchandise. Like pride branded fucking everything that you can get one month out of a year. Pride was a riot for fuck's sake. Pride started by a black trans woman throwing a cop at a, or a brick at a cop. That's queer history, dude. That's what we should be celebrating. Not Adidas coming out with some dumbass rainbow print whatever. Not this celebrity or that celebrity coming out. Not this product making a Pride Month special run of who gives a shit. The commodification of something is really the death of it. When something is commodified, it it's what it dies a second time, right? Perfect example of Che, che Guevara t-shirts. <laughs> or Malcolm X t-shirts, even. I just, I want to be able to do something. I want to be able to meaningfully impact the world around me. For 
good. A lot of leftists I admire and respect have been talking more and more, especially now, with increasing frequency, fear and desperation about gun ownership. About arming themselves. I think there's a lot of validity to it, honestly. I continue to think it's not for me, though. But, you know, I could change my mind. I could be persuaded. I could. I really could. If militias keep killing protesters, if cops keep killing innocent people, if nobody is punished, if no justice is had, if economic situ conditions continue to get worse, if evictions start picking up, if there's a call for it, dude, I don't know. Maybe. Now, uh, the right to bear arms in this country, Second Amendment, was so that a well-armed population could prevent the rise of tyranny. It's funny. Right, it didn't do that, like, at all. <laughs> Tyranny never really left the United States. Oh, it changed its mask. Absolutely. Authoritarianism never, never truly left. Inequality never truly departed these shores. King George was not evil. Right? The abuses laid upon this country significant and noteworthy in a way but they weren't any injustices we didn't then issue upon ourselves I mean taxation without representation we do that oh sure you have a representative but do they actually represent you no they represent the people who donated to their campaign. Uh, Americans have very little say in what ultimately happens to our country. In what decisions are ultimately made, and what policies are ultimately enforced or embraced or ignored. What reforms are made or aren't made. Oh, we can write our congressperson, our representative. But legally, they're not obligated to listen. They're not obligated to do what we want. So, the inherent threat of violence, or force, or power in the Second Amendment is supposed to reinforce that voice, reinforce that agency, reinforce and push back against overreach of federal agencies and federal power, but... You know, I'm not an anarchist. I have a, a lot of good folk that I admire that are anarchists. Not me, dude. Not me. Um, but even I can inherently recognize the problems with sort of any kind of government. God, I'm getting tired. I think I'll wrap up soon. It's, it's not late, but... I'm still waking up at like 2 in the morning most days because stress, because, you know, the fucking fall of New Rome over here. If you are in a city where you have friends and family, where you have a community, and you feel called to protest, if you feel called to demonstrate, I encourage you to do so. I encourage you to do so safely. I encourage you to do so under the leadership and example of black leaders, and black voices. I encourage you to stand in solidarity and support these protests and this movement in whatever way you can. If you are like I was on unemployment just scraping by, or not even scraping by. Signal boost. Share the news. 
make a point to read news from <laughs> leftists and individuals actually out there on the ground, not just corporate news that send people to make a headline to talk about how riding is bad. Sure, what's actually going on with friends and family? Argue with them. Change hearts and minds, if that's all you can do. If you can protest, hell yeah. If you can participate in direct action, be safe. But... Yeah, I I have so many friends in Lafayette and West Lafayette, Indiana, who have talked about, well, you know, there's just not enough socialists or progressives or anarchists or whatever here to, to really make a difference. Now, there's too many conservatives that I've almost gotten to the point where I have started a fucking local DSA chapter for them. You know, the DSA isn't, like, some revolutionary body, right? It's it's progressive. That's that's about it. It's good. Is it great? No, it's good. But I, I haven't done it because it just feels weird and disingenuous as somebody from outside a community to make something for the community. I really want to just grab my good friends from that area and shake them by the fucking shoulders and be like, what the fuck are you doing? Like... There are organizations you can join. There are organizations you can sign up with and organize with and collaborate with. Like, I, I have such a hard time understanding not feeling shaken up, not feeling like violently ill and sick and desperate and distraught day to day at what's going on i ha i have a hard time understanding how people can be comfortable just kind of sticking their heads in the sand and pretending that nothing is happening or accepting that oh, something is happening but it's not here how do you how do you turn yourself off like that how do you lose your empathy and connection with thousands and millions of other people how do you just ignore that because i i can't or at least i have a really hard time doing so I'm not trying to flex as if i'm some sort of you know empathy wunderkind i'm just a person and I care about people. And I don't understand how the hell we've gotten to a point where that's controversial. Well, no, I, I do understand it. I'm just exhausted by it, and I hate it, and I loathe it, and God, if... If I could leave this country and go somewhere else, I would be very tempted to. But I, and I've spoken to this before, I'm not convinced that running away is the best idea. Because whatever happens here won't stop here. If the United States has a revolution, if it has a civil war, if it has miraculous reforms that didn't need violence if it has a fascist takeover if it maintains through violence neoliberal regime that it has right now etc 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 whatever it ends up doing however the wind ends up blowing now, the united states is a wind vane for much of the rest of the world wherever we go whatever we do others follow for better or for worse, often just for worse. So I feel like packing up, running away, is just hoping that other people fight my battles for me. 
other people do the hard political work for me, do the hard organizing work for me, do the hard protesting and politicking and living for me. I mean, what can be more American than that, right? Just the stubborn insistence that other people do everything for you and you reap all the benefit. And then get indignant when the benefit isn't exactly the way you like it and the color you want it. Oh. I need to learn Spanish. Move to Cuba. I've been thinking about, and I've been trying to learn Mandarin for a long time. My Mandarin's terrible. I uh, certainly do not hold the uh, PRC, People's Republic of China, as being a, <laughs> a bastion of um, progressive values, the kind of which resonate with me. No, no, they're... They're a very authoritarian state. Um, but they're powerful, and they will continue to be powerful and influential probably longer than my country will. But Spanish, oh god, if I could just go to Cuba. What, what Cuba needs is not more gringos trying to colonize it because they're running away from a failing country. That's what happened with Spain. <laughs> I don't think, don't think they want the Americanos coming down and being like, please Cuba, please take us in, yeah. There's always Canada, but really, any way that the U.S. goes, the Can Canadians are going to go. We're just too economically intertwined, we're too geographically close, and geopolitically intertwined. I have a really hard time imagining the USA going fascist, and Canada not. Well, you know, I'd love to be surprised. Love to wake up one day and just see red banners outside my window. And this crypto-socialist movement has been sweeping for 40 years, is finally ready. <laughs> it's it's uh it's interesting to me how many this soft in small ways and this is probably the last thing I'm gonna talk about before I cut for the night uh, get off of here for the night small ways that media popular media in particular eats away at the validity of socialism, for example, and other uh, progressive, reformist, revolutionary causes. Like, uh, the new modern duty, modern duty, <laughs> modern warfare, the new Call of Duty, is uh, Cold War focused. Reagan is like a benefactor in that. Oh yeah, no, no politics there. Nope. Or in the Umbrella Academy. With the promo for that being, in the first episode being, in season two, that, oh, the Soviets are gonna take over and it's the end of the world again. Why do we, why do we gotta keep using the Soviets as the bad guys? Why not, oh, I don't know, look at the truth of the matter and realize that the Americans have been the bad guys for, like, ever. I, I have such a intolerance for the use of Soviets as a knee-jerk, like, oh yeah, let's go fight the commies, or Russians, or whatever, because it's nothing. It's nothing. It's such a fake enemy. It's such a... F a phantom. Uh, I don't know. I would really like to not see 
<laughs> tweets about mm, the new rose garden looks like one from Russia. Who gives a shit? Who who actually gives a shit? I don't. I do. Honestly, at this point, I don't give a fuck if troll uh, Trump is a Russian agent. I love that my brain defaulted him to troll. Don't give a shit. Um, Russian, American, who really cares, right? What matters is class. What matters is they're all capitalists. They have no empathy or interest in helping the proletariat or even the bourgeois or the petty bourgeois. They, they really only care about themselves. And at the end of the day, that's all I really need to know. You're no comrade of mine, so fuck you. Um, yep, yep, yep. I'm tired, I'm bitter, everything's terrible. Thousands of people are dying every day, the economy's failing. Uh, like, the 30,000 Americans are on unemployment right now, which probably means something like 100,000 Americans are trying to be on employment on unemployment, but failing, maybe more than that. <sighs> Children are going hungry, families are having increased food insecurity. I mean, if you look at food production in the US, that's way down if you're looking at like raw production of materials in the United States, that's way down. Construction is way down. Just fucking. Mm, no, we're not gonna have a depression that's worse than the Great Depression. It's just beautifully prophetic how uh, Deep Space Nine <laughs> got this pretty much to a T. The 2020s being uh, maybe the darkest period in American history. Let's hope it is. Let's hope it is the darkest period. And after this, it's all uphill. Organize with your friends and family, with your neighbors, your community, with organizations like the DSA. Participate however you can. Take care of yourself and take care of the people around you. And until whenever the fuck I post something like this again, I'm going to say toodaloo, take care. I will see you then. Bye-bye.